Um, how many people here already know about Project Censored? Yes, so I will give you the very quick history version, and I, I will not pretend like you don't know what Project Censored is. The, uh, the, the talks vary on the basis of who seems to know what about it. Uh, Project Censored then, as you probably know, was founded in 1976 by Dr. Carl Jensen, a former journalist and communications professor at Snow State University. Um, the genesis of the project came about surrounding the, uh, a, a re-examination of the Nixon election of uh, 1972 on the basis of the Watergate scandal and alternative media coverage of it. Back then, alternative media coverage really did used to mean something uh, fairly significant, um, meaning it wasn't corporate mainstream. It used to be that people use the term mainstream media. I, I think people still do use it, but I think they may use it erroneously. Um, it is really corporate. There's nothing mainstream about corporate uh, media. It's the top-down managed news, propaganda for commerce and advertising, and uh, social engineering and control. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but the question was, is you know, Jensen went back and asked, well, how could that possibly have happened that Nixon won, given these scandals, and given that the you know, alternative media, uh, the smaller press, the independent press, were, were writing about all these things? And then he went back and looked at it, and he said, well, that's because um, the other groups weren't writing about it, and the message wasn't widespread, and he, so he, it just sparked this question of, well, what else is, what else is not being covered? What else is matter-of-factly going on, and is yet not part of the, the mainstream political discourse or cultural discourse. And so he started Project Censored, and it's a, we're still a student-based operation or student resource organization. Um, we believe that um, academia is not an ivory tower. Um, we, we believe that it is a commons. And we, we believe that uh, that everybody should should have a right to know what's going on and have a right to learn skills to be media literate and so forth. And so did Carl Jensen, and so did Peter Phillips, a sociologist, when he took over in 1996. Um, and we've been doing annual books since 1993. Uh, by the way, if you're interested, you seem to already know about the, uh, about us. But at ProjectCensored.org, you can get our websites. Uh, at our website, you can go back and see all the stories that we've looked at all the way since 1976. Um, you can now, at our, one of our sister sites, we have MediaFreedomInternational.org, you can see all of the, the stories that we're researching year-round in real time as they're validated. We call them validated independent news. Anybody can nominate a story that they believe is undercovered, underreported, quote-unquote censored, um, that they think is, is ripe for consideration. We still do the annual book, Seven Stories Press, great press out of New York, Dan Simon and everybody, still do that. Um, but we, we've changed uh, with the times. Um, again, it took some time to change, but we've been changing quite a bit in the last few years, and we're going to continue to do that um, into, into the future, uh, which means that we don't think that censorship is something that's disappearing. Um, in other words, it's something that has really changed and become arguably more of a problem in our culture. Um, even though we have the internet, and even though we have these phenomenons of WikiLeaks, and we do have all kinds of access to information, but a bulk of people in the population don't really know how to get it, or where to find it. And one of the most frequent questions that we get when we talk all around the country is, whom do you trust? Whom should we trust? How do we build these trustworthy relationships with our media sources? There's no magic answer to that. It's obviously an issue of time, critical thinking, um, assessment of facts, sourcing, transparency, so it, it takes a lot of time. And given that we increasingly live in this instant gratification culture, right, and our technological gadgetry like, sort of facilitates that issue, like I can dial it in right now and I can get anything I want right now, but it, your brain still takes a while to process things, you know? Just because you have a faster and faster microprocessor in your, your phone or your gadget doesn't mean your, your brain is taking it all in any faster or more comprehensively. So this exacerbates some of our problems, but at any rate, um, I, it's given that, again, you know sort of uh, the genesis of the project, you know the history of how, uh, what Project Censored has done. Um, let me, from the outset, explain how we've been using the term censorship for 35 years. So Project Censored is the oldest con uh, con contiguously existing media research organization in the country. We're 10 years older than FAIR that just celebrated their 25th anniversary last week in New York. Um, so we have been around, but what is the definition of censorship that we're operating from? Because the first kind of critique that we get is, well, hey, that's not censored. How did you find out about it? <laughs> right? That's a pretty, pretty good question. Uh, 
if it's censored, how would we know? Well, censorship is not simply the, the, you know, the black hand of the state that comes down and wipes out the story so that no one ever hears it. Does that happen? Yes. Um, do we know more about that because of things like WikiLeaks or the Pentagon Papers? Yes. Do we know this is real? Yes. Uh, the the uh, journalist, independent journalist that wrote the introduction to our book this year is Christina Borgeson. Anybody here familiar with Christina Borgeson? Um, if you're not familiar with Christina Borges, and she's written a couple of really great, edited a couple of really great books about post 9-11 censorship. And it's all first-hand accounts from journalists, many of them very prominent journalists, that talk exactly about what happened to them and why they couldn't publish their stories. In other words, they give first-hand evidence that censorship is a very real problem. Wait, there's that word again. Censorship, then, is anything that interferes with the free flow of information in a society that purports to have a free, free press structure or free press system. It includes framing, it includes false balancing, it includes sliding of content, it includes biases, it includes a whole host of things. Of course it includes withholding information, uh, but more so, uh, the type of censorship that we see that is very prevalent in our culture in the United States is propaganda, is news, is propaganda. And um, we're very, I'm very happy to say this year in our, I'll get back to this truth emergency question that we, we raised. I have an entire section in the book coming out in the 2012 version that's based all on propaganda theory and analysis. And um, actually our host this evening, Dr. Jacob uh, Van Vliet, is contributing a cha chapter on Jacques Lul. Um, and we have a lot of other folks doing that. But we, we, uh, again, we're really serious about this problem of propaganda and propaganda as censorship. Um, again, historic, historic, um, definitions of, of censorship have often been quite limiting to only government and only stories being wiped out. But if you take a look at, at the way stories are reported, and if you take a look at the top stories that we have in the book every year, they are obviously stories that are published. And, and some of them are even published in, in some of the corporate media, and you'll say, oh, well, that can't be possibly censored. But if it's buried at the end of the business section in a local paper, and it's only reported on one time, then it isn't exactly being covered in a way that people have access to it. This gets again back to that problem of accessibility. So our definition of censorship from the beginning has been fairly broad, but it hasn't been broad to the point, I don't think, that it is um, unuseful. Uh, I think that the definition of censorship needs to be broad, and we are very specific about how we relate it to specific cases, because it comes in many guises. And I think that that's one of the things that, uh, that's really one of the things that drew me to Project Censored, um, when I grew up in Western Pennsylvania and I saw this book called Censored uh, in, uh, back in 1992-93, it was the first book that came out, um, and it just caught my eye, and uh, when I looked through it, I said, yes, yeah, yeah, this, this is a problem, this is something that's going on. I was more active in censorship in the arts at the time. Um, but as far as, you know, news media and so forth, you know, I saw this as a real serious, serious problem. Um, a strange fate would have it, I ended up out in California, and now I'm director of Project Censored, so that's a, an interesting story, but I will save that for another time. Um, but what we're looking at now at Project Censored, given, that, given this definition of what we're talking about with censorship, is we're, we're looking to aggregate stories in terms of what we call censored news clusters. You're probably all familiar that the Bay, uh, the Bay Guardian releases our sto the, the top ten stories every year yeah, in San Francisco. Um, I've been doing that for a long time. And people are accustomed to the listing, you know, the top 25 censored stories. And we're actually changing the billing of the book and we're changing the subtitles of the book this year because anybody that's ever picked one up and browsed through it realizes that the top 25 censored stories are not all of what's in the book. Um, we have a lot of media studies, media analysis, propaganda studies and analysis. We have a whole host of things that are going on. Quite frankly, uh, Dr. Kathleen's, Kathleen Berry's book uh, could be a huge chapter in Project Censored. Um, all of the things that Dr. Barry was talking about are things that are not widely discussed or disseminated in, in our corporate media structures. In fact, they're ignored. Uh, and when they do come up, they're denigrated. Um, you know, it's not macho enough, and, or you know, whether it's soft on communism or soft on terrorism, anybody that has an empathetic gene you know, somewhere in their body is sort of ridiculed as weak. Um, and th that's, that's censorship. And you know that that's, that whole book is full of issues that people should be very aware of. So again, um, we're looking at these censored news clusters, and when we talk about that, we're relating the stories thematically. 
So if you take a look at the 2011 book and you see the top story is the collapse of the dollar. It's an economic, you know, political economy story. The second story is the Pentagon is the biggest polluter. The third story is net neutrality and the loss of internet accessibility and censorship on the web. Uh, four is ice raids, uh, immigrant stories. You know, and they're all like everywhere across the map. Um, and I, the problem with that is that if you take a look at the stories collectively, there are very specific topics that recur. Power elite stories, uh, stories of so-called expendables, tiered structures of how people are labeled and sort of looked upon in our society. Um, and so we're, we're really going into this direction of trying, we're gonna have the list, because people like lists, but we're gonna really look at the stories in their news clusters, and we're gonna take a look at what are the themes and what are the patterns of censorship and obfuscation of important and significant information that a free press culture and a democracy needs to know about in order to govern itself effectively? And again, effectively, I, I think that we, we, we don't need to look too far between public opinion polls and public policy, between whether it's Bush or Obama, that public opinion may be overwhelmingly saying one thing about a particular issue and the Congress and the President seem to be all the way at the other end. Um, Democracy is sort of an expedient tool. Whenever the majority has been manufactured to support a particular policy, it's touted as a great democratic virtue that the policy is put into place. Whenever the public wants something else that the established power will not put into place, it's simply ignored and acts as if it doesn't exist. That's censorship. Classic examples of that, we have over 70-80% of the public wants a public option for a pair, uh, single payer health care. Not on the table, not even part of the discussion. Right? A majority of people want to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan, not on the table, not really happening. If it is, it's smoke and mirrors, it's shell game. You can see the, uh, the official death of Osama bin Laden did not lead to a massive outpouring of, of oh, we have to get out of uh, Afghanistan, let's get out, the war is over. You know, we don't see the historic picture on the cover of Life magazine of the soldier and the woman kissing each other after peace is declared and everybody is saying, okay, going home. No, well, what do we see? We see a new bill, a defense authorization bill, with a section 1034 buried in it that basically allows infinite executive warfare. Um, and by the way, why is, does anybody know about that story? You know, that's another one of those stories that that, that, should, that should be on the front page of the so-called liberal media, um, but, but it isn't. Um, so at Project Censored, another thing we look at isn't, isn't just these unreported stories. We look at, why, well, why? <laughs> why are these stories not reported? And when you start to really uh, do power, uh, Peter Phillips um, studied under Dom Hoff and, and others, and they do power elite analysis. Um, and so there is a lot of sociological root to the research that's being done about top-down power elites and control and who benefits from decisions that are made and how a democracy is basically uh, a tool of power elites. And we just described that in part. Of course, when you look at the ownership of media, that's another thing that takes part um, as, as part of this matrix of control. Owners benefit from information disseminated to the public that creates consumers, that doesn't generate terrible questioning, that doesn't foster critical thinking, that creates sort of a hive mind type mentality. Um, you can go back and look at the history of propaganda theory, and you're going to see people like Eddie Bernays, nephew of Sigmund Freud, talking all about the invisible government, the people that make these decisions behind the closed doors and behind the curtains and the PR masters and the masters of spin. These are the people that really have an undue impact on the way that we have our discourse framed. And that does limit possibilities. And so, again, at Project Sensory, one of the things we look at is how this is happening, why this is happening, and we also address what do we do about these types of problems. Um, I think it's, again, it's, it's really um, redundant to call attention to what type of circus corporate media really is. Um, in our society, we have had since 1984 a, a section uh, of our research and then later in our books called Junk Food News and News Abuse. And it, uh, because the critique was is that, well, Project Censors, it, you guys are really rough on journalists and, and you know, the structure of journalism and so forth. And hey, look, in the real world, um, certain decisions must be made, deadlines need to be met. There's only so many column inches, there's only so much time on, 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 the, on the show, because concision, brevity, etc. Uh, and so again, Carl Jensen and later Peter Phillips and I, we're, we're all looking at these things and we're saying, okay, um, so what do you spend all your precious column inches on and all your time on? What are you, what are you doing? 
Uh, I didn't mean, just give you a quick example of that, um, you know, without getting into Tiger Woods' harem or, uh, you know, any of the, you know, the Balloon Boy's dad and, you know, whatever, whatever else, or Charlie Sheen's latest meltdown. And, you know, you, you, you see enough of this. At NBC, MSNBC, you know, in the midst of all these things that are going on in Afghanistan, uh, uh, they, all, they ran three-hour Charlie Sheen shows over the weekend. You know, because that was apparently more important than, you know, the rest of the things going on. Well, and by the way, this junk food news problem, getting very old, Neil Postman once said at NYU, we were the uh, least informed, most entertained society in the world. But that was back in 1985 and amusing ourselves to death. And here we are, you know, much later. And we've really just spiraled off the rails in terms of what corporate media is dealing with. So when we take a look at what corporate media are doing and how they're handling these things, here's one of these, here's the thing I put in, I had to throw this in the book because it was just astounding. 9-11 um, uh, was, a, was a major event, a major tragedy. It was also a major news event, right? And it's uh, so it turned into this, you know, the 24-7 news culture that comes out of the 80s. It seeks the stories, which in some way may trivialize some stories. 9-11 clearly is not a trivialized story, however. Um, it's a sensationalized story, uh, even though it's a sensational event. But let's give you this example, Wolf Blitzer at CNN, um, the quote-unquote most trusted name in news. Uh, they did you know, long swaths of uninterrupted com news and commentary about 9-11. They, they were like, we're not cutting to commercial. We're not cutting to commercial. You know, that's, in, in the corporate media, that's kind of a note to the public that this is an important story. Pay attention. <laughs> right? It's like, we're not even cutting to commercial. Uh, you know, where will the money come from? Um, <laughs> So it's an important story, right? You're like, hey, don't cut the commercial. You, I gotta sweep. This is too important, uh, and, and rightfully so. Well, so and they were running 90-minute, you know, story parts of stories with no commercial interruption. Guess what? The next time was when CNN ran 90 minutes of uninterrupted coverage. What was the earth-shattering event that rivaled 9/11? The death of Anna Nicole Smith. Uninterrupted, fetishistic, insane commentary and coverage by, again, Wolf Blitzer. So, these are pretty strange bookends in American media culture, I'd say. On one end, you've got 9-11, actual serious tragedy, major global implications, given the U.S. standing in the world. On the other end, it's Anne Nicole Smith, personal tragedy. Sure, epic. Definitely. I mean, a sad story. Very sad story for this woman. There's no doubt. I'm not, I'm not making light of that. But in terms of news media coverage, and how there seems to be no critical ability of differentiation between the potential global significance and cultural significance of these events, that shows a clear decay of critical faculties and judgment in some of these newsrooms. Hyperreality is we, we kind of refer to this problem as a part of hyperreality, and Baudrillard talked about this you know, in the first Gulf War, and we talk about it in Project Censored in our junk food news chapters. And we've, we're a culture that has lost the ability to discern between that which is real and not manufactured and not important, significant, trivial, fleeting. Uh, and you know, many folks have written about this. Of course, Chris Hedges among them, borrowing a lot from. You know, postman and us. Sorry, but true. Even though we're not cited, um, but the point is still there. This is a growing problem in our society, and this is also part of the culture of censorship. It's the infatuation with the trivial and the inane over that of substance. And look, Americans are not uh, stupid people, but we have a culture that really pushes us into these directions. You know, was, uh, Jacob and I teach at Diablo Valley College, and, um, and we see bright students all the time. But we also see a cultural shift, you know, where, 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 where because of the educational systems and the media systems, which are educational systems, whether we like it or not, they're conditioning systems, they really are driving out the ability of people to think critically and independently. You know, we're so far off the rails of Dewey's idea of what public education ought to look like that, I mean, you know, it's, again, we're, we're really in a top-down propaganda adult structure that creates workers or widgets, and they're creating workers for what? I don't know, because we're not making anything anymore. This is a real problem. 
And you know, corporate media doesn't really focus a lot of attention on, on that. How do corporate media measure our economic prowess? Stock market, which most people aren't in. Uh, doesn't really impact too many things with most of the people. But they look at the stock market is up, everything must be great. The banks are paying record uh, uh, bonuses uh, to their CEOs. Everything is getting better. Except for, you know, everybody else. Or it's not. It's not getting better. Everybody in here has ten stories about how it's not getting better for themselves or people they know. I guarantee it. But that's not part of the narrative. You know, and it, it's not because the narrative has to be a downer. It's because that's a real narrative that if people were collectively more organized around, then they would be more mobilized to do something about it. They would be more empowered to do something about it. The, the effects of censorship on a culture renders it impotent to deal with its own problems and its own issues and troubles. So again, censorship is a real serious problem. And, and I think the biggest problem at all is that because America lives, uh, again, to borrow from Hedges, as an empire of illusion, we have a gap, yawning gap between our perceptions and what reality may actually be in, in the fact-based world, that we're incapable of understanding what we're to do about it to the degree to which that we don't realize that we even are being systematically lied to by media on a daily basis. Or we don't want to believe that this is something that's happening on a daily basis. And I'm not just talking about Glenn Beck and Fox and, 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 and our friend uh, Wolf, Wolf Blitzer that we mentioned here earlier. It's happening all over. Peter Phillips and I have a radio show over at KPFA. And until very recently, there were a lot of things that you're not allowed to talk about at Free Speech Radio. It seemed crazy to me. But there's a lot of things that uh, so-called muckraker types and free thinkers on the left w don't want to address, maybe because they have a certain type of ideology and a, and, a, and a penchant for a particular type of one analysis over another. But again, when we're talking about muckrake type journalism and we're talking about radical efforts to enforce free press standards we have to go to the root radical means go to the root we have to go to the roots of the problems and the roots of what's going on in the world and in order to do that we have to be dealing with the real information the factual information and if you're going to start having a discussion out uh, you know in a, in a purported free press platform that says like well we can talk about all this and we're not against censorship except for that then that's the same problem all over again. And granted, uh, critical faculties would suggest that we don't entertain things that aren't factually supported or that are largely speculative or that are purposefully emotional or di uh, divisive uh, in, 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 for its own sake. But again, at Project Censored, we have not shied away from controversial issues or stories that are rooted in factual evidence. Again, that has not won us lots of friends. We've been slammed from the right. We've been slammed from the left. Often, you know, when Peter and I are talking to each other, we feel like our heads are in a vice, you know, and they're going you know, to explode at any minute. Um, because uh, we seem to uh, always be stumbling across some type of resistance because somebody doesn't like something about some of these kinds of stories, which to us uh, really more indicates that we're, we're on to part of the problem. And we certainly aren't the, uh, you know, the sole antidote to the problem. This is, again, why we're really student-based. We have over 30 colleges and universities doing this research with us now. We're in over six different countries. We need you to help us nominate stories, validate stories, research stories. As our friend David Matheson says, we need to be the media. We need to be parts of the solution. And the best way to do that is to communicate honestly, forthrightly, and transparently with each other especially if we have disagreements. Not, oh, we have a disagreement about that, let's just not bring it up. <laughs> let's not talk about that. But I don't want to talk about 9-11. I don't want to talk about election fraud. Uh, I don't want to talk about the abridgment of civil liberties under Obama because I voted for Obama and he's better than the other guy. I didn't vote for Obama, by the way. <laughs> but this, this mentality, you know, like why is it okay that we have um, a Cass Sunstein committing what he calls acts of cognitive infiltration in certain groups of activism because he believes that they should be disrupted COINTELPRO style 
where is the outcry on the left for that significant abridgment of civil liberties when under Bush, whenever Alberto Gonzalez or John Yu were rewriting the Constitution and interpreting international law to move their own standards, there was no shortage of outrage from the ACLU or the left or the National Lawyers Guild and progressive people and so forth. But yet, bring up Cass Sunstein in a room of liberals or even leftists and you hear crickets. Oh, they're targeting those crazy groups over there. I like how we all become the ethical and moral guardians and decision makers. Remember Bush? I'm the decider, see? We all become the deciders of these stories and say, oh, it's okay if we marginalize that group. Oh, it's okay if we marginalize that story. No, it isn't. And again, when we really say that when, when, when Peter and I talk about it, the fact that we are in this truth emergency, we literally are living in a society that has lost the ability to discern between that which is real and not. We live in a society that yearns to understand things that are happening but and seeks the truth but has no idea where to find it. This is part of a process, it's part of our educational system, it's part of our media structure, it's a broad problem. You can point your finger all over the place and certainly back at yourself. What are you doing about it to make yourself a more informed or more literate person on a daily basis? At Project Censored, we have the uh, censorednews.org where we have RSS daily feeds from independent news sites from all over the, uh, the country and the world that are independent, non-corporate sources. Are they all perfect? Are they all right? No. But are they a place to get away from the corporate top-down drumbeat of the same stories and themes? Yes, they are. And it's a great place to go. You get more stories in one day than you'll see in the New York Times just on the censorednews.org site. And we have a daily censored blog where we have investigative research and things going on all week long that are run by our webmaster, Adam Armstrong. And so we're really trying to model some of the changes. Are we doing everything right? No. But we're making efforts to do things and be media democracy in action. And again, this, this is, a, this is the, the sort of the, the magnitude of the things that we're up against. And it goes back a long ways. I want to stop here in a minute and just talk, and have you talk, actually. Um, but, but this, to me, was a pretty apt uh, quote that happened to be in the, in, in the beginning of this um, Hedges book on the death of the liberal class. It was, a, it was an introduction to Animal Farm, George Orwell, entitled Freedom of the Press. But it was, a, it, was a, it was an introduction that was never published in Animal Farm. It came out in a Times Literary Supplement in the early 1970s. Orwell obviously wrote it when he was alive. Uh, um, but, but just over half a century ago, just listen to this. And I think this really uh, describes what we're up against, and it really does frame what we're doing at Project Censored and, and why we think it's so important to get these stories out to people, understand the problems of junk food news, address the current truth emergency in which we exist, and look at international models, not just domestic models, but international models of media freedom. Orwell wrote, at any given moment, there is an orthodoxy, a body of ideas, which, is it, is, which it is assumed that all right-thinking people will accept without question. It is not exactly forbidden to say this, that, or the other, but it is not done to say it. Just as in Victorian times, it was not done to mention trousers in the presence of a lady. Anyone who challenges the prevailing orthodoxy finds himself, or herself, silenced with surprising effectiveness. A genuinely unfashionable opinion is almost never given a fair hearing, either in the popular press or in the highbrow periodicals. You could write that last week. So we still face these challenges. I think one of the differences is, is we now face these challenges with technology at our disposal. Not all of us. But more of us, particularly in the United States, have the means and ability to address these problems, become the media, and really try to expose the chicanery of the top-down corporate propaganda that we're really treated to overwhelmingly around the clock. And I, I refer to that again because over 70% of the people in the United States still get their news from television. So that's really a significant issue. And even if the people in here, the media literate people, say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah not me, um, that doesn't mean that you're addressing the problem. Yeah, not you. Well, then not you needs to go and get a blog or get on your own show or do something. Amy Goodman can't save the world by herself. 
You know, and look at how many things democracy now doesn't cover. Right? Is it because Amy's a censor? Is she a gatekeeper? We hear that. She's a gatekeeper. She's really busy, I can tell you that. She's a person, I can tell you that. Why do we wait for these saviors to fix our own media system when we should be our media system? So that's again what one of the big messages of Project Censored is, is that we urge people to be part of the solution by not sitting back passively and taking the information that they're spoon fed. So with that, we continue into our 35th year. Um, we're uh, just now finishing up the 2012 book for June. It'll be out in September. The 2011 book, of course, here is available. We have several chapters, a great chapter by Lance Damon Smith on state crimes against democracy and ways to talk about controversial issues without getting into conspiracy theory uh, type labeling. Um, you know, we have chapters on secession. We have chapters, again, on becoming the media. You know, so there are a whole lot of things we're doing in Project Censored, and I thank everybody here for coming out and supporting uh, what we're doing. And again, this is also a formal invitation. Anybody that wants to get involved in what we're doing and can help out and has skills and has interests, uh, we're all ears. You can contact us through projectcensored.org. Thank you.